Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Please stand with us. We're going to sing a song. It's called King of Heaven. And, and before we do, let's open in a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, this uh, wonderful summer weather. And uh, God, we thank you for the truth of your word. And as we uh, dive into your word this morning, as we take the time to learn more about you, to learn from you, to be challenged by you, to be encouraged by you, I pray, God, that uh, we would go away from this building, uh, the church, that we would go into the community of Timmins, that we would be salt and light, and that uh, you would affect lives through us, God, for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, everybody, and welcome to First Baptist Church. I'm Corey Ferlardo. I'm the Deacon of Maintenance here. So glad that you can join us here today on this nice, beautiful, sunny day. Um, and for those of you online as well, I'm glad that you can be participating in the service today. And if you're not ill and you're, you're here in town, we'd love for you to join us next Sunday. So for the announcements, I'm clicking the wrong buttons here. One moment. There we go. All right, so if you are new or haven't been here for a long time and you consider yourself a, a guest here, and if you haven't already done so, we have a welcome center at the back, and you are more than welcome, and we would be more than glad to have you there to 
ask questions about our church, how you can be part of our church, what it means to be here at First Baptist Church. And also, if it's your first time, you will receive a gift card for Tim Hortons for uh, filling out your information. And then we would love to get to know you better, uh, get a hold of you, and uh, make you a part of our family here. Also, for housekeeping, if there ever is an emergency, which we, we pray that there isn't any ever, we have an exit right there, which is a pretty steep emergency staircase, so we'll, we'll keep the agile people for, for that exit. And for the rest of you, we have the main entrance that you came in here today, and we also have one behind the Welcome Center, which brings you out into the driveway. And for those of you with children, once they go down to Kids Church, if there was an emergency, please do not go and get your children. There is a protocol downstairs for the, the ministry downstairs. They will bring your children out to you, so there's not any chaos, so... You can drain up your children at the, uh, at the front here. Also, our washrooms to my right to your left. If you go into there, there are two washrooms. There are also two more washrooms if you go back down the main staircase, and they're just around the corner. Kidopolis is approaching fast. It's at the end of this month, Ju July 31st. Uh, we have had to cancel a few times in the past due to COVID and lack of volunteering as well. Uh, if you are available that week, please make an effort to be participating in some form or another. Don't assume you're too busy. Go and ask on what you can do to help. You can help in the evenings to clean up, set up for the next day. If you're available during the day to help with the children in the activities, even better. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, things you can do. And I'm also reminding myself that if you have an hour, you have an hour. So do what you can and, and just... Show, show your interest, and these kids are coming from all places and backgrounds. They're not necessarily children from church. This might be the first time they'd be here at God, so it's a very good ministry. Um, it's, the kids are having a blast. They get to know each other as well and uh, make some good friendships. Uh, the pastor has dedicated his household and his hospitality this summer. Uh, he already had the first one, so I'm assuming he's brave enough to follow through with the two other ones. So the last weekend of every month, he's been hosting at his house, and I believe it's a potluck. Yes, it's a potluck. So all the information is there and also on our website if you forget, and it's a good time of fellowship and, and eating as well. Um, that's it for the announcements today. Also, um, an informal announcement uh, it's been beautiful this weather, and summer's kicking around, we tend to do our own thing, but let's not forget to be meeting together, and especially those with children. Um, if, you know, we can be calling each other up, going to Hershey Lake, or Gillies Lake, or whatever, and just, Ivanhoe is another one. Tomorrow, there you go. So, so just keep in touch. Uh, and for those of you that are, are older, go for walks around Gillies. Just make sure that we stay uh, in fellowship together throughout the summer and to uh, not be neglecting meeting with one another. And that includes at church as well. All right, so that's all I have. You can feel free to keep worshiping. One more, more, one more thing, sorry about that. Uh, for those of you that have been joining in our study, there is a study tonight at 7 p.m., and it's going to be led by Mark Bracken. So for those of you who haven't had the privilege of hearing Mark speak, it's uh, definitely a blessing in, in, a, in a tree. So uh, it's going to be at 7 tonight here at the church, and they're continuing in the study of Philippians. So please join us.
At this time is when we bring our prayers to the Lord, and uh, we are accepting donations as well. If you would like to give, we have a box here at the back for those of you who prefer giving in person. We also have a, a mail slot at our door for throughout the week, and Kelly will accept that and, and take care of that for you. We have a e-transferring. We have other means as well. If you can go on our website, that'll guide you through. It's very straightforward. Our, our website is very user-friendly. All the main icons for, for community, everything, serving, it's all at the front. You just click on that, and it guides you through the process and the people to get in contact with as well. We'd like to be praying. Uh, the majority of our prayers today are for our children. We have our Killopolis week coming up. For those kids who have not heard the Lord, we, we pray that they will and that they uh, will understand that God loves them and uh, that they will accept them into their hearts. We have interns starting this week as well for our church for the summer. And, of course, Isabel at Emerson, who are abroad uh, ministering uh, in the different countries as well. And I'm sure there are plenty of other prayers, both praises and prayers. Uh, so let's be thinking of those as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us today to be focused on you, Lord, and also uh, communion to be reflecting um, on what you have done for us and what you continue to do for us, Lord. I pray for the children that will be uh, going to Kidopolis, Lord. I pray they feel accepted and, and full of joy, full of love, Lord. Um, but ultimately, I pray that the word and the news that they hear of you, of you Lord, um, the awesome opportunity that we have in you when we accept you in our hearts, Lord, and when we follow you. I pray that they understand that. I pray that they're just overfilled with joy and curiosity. I, I pray that this week just kickstart their, their journey with you, Lord, and that um, they just want to know more about you and ask questions and, and come back or just ask their parents what it means to follow you. And if, and if their parents don't know you as well, that the curiosity of their children uh, brings them to you, Lord, brings them to your church and just, just brings more people to your kingdom, Lord. I pray for the interns starting this week. I pray that they be uh, uh, a great service to the church and to the leaders and uh, to the ministries, Lord. I pray that uh, they are also filled with the Spirit and filled with energy and, and enthusiasm to relieve those have, that have been working hard all year. And ultimately, Lord, that they, uh, they grow in you throughout the summer and they just uh, get to know you better. We pray for Is Isabel and Emerson. As well, we pray that uh, they're doing well over there. They're healthy. They're, uh, I'm sure they're experiencing all kinds of exciting and also uh, probably hard realization of, of what the world is, is like outside of our walls, outside of our country, Lord, and, and the prosecution and, and the, just the, the hurting that is involved. But, uh, Lord, I pray that just opens their eyes and, and brings them joy to know that they know you and that they can share you with others. And Lord, we pray that uh, as we give cheerfully and sacrificially, Lord, I pray that it glorifies you and that um, it's a, as an act of worship, Lord, and also that uh, you are refining us through this process as we, as we give our first to you, as we trust in you, that you provide for our needs, that we can give back to you and that ultimately it can serve others in need, and, and grow your kingdom here in downtown Timmins. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Please stand with us. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down Worship Him now, how great, how awesome is He. 
We'll be uh, doing communion in just a few moments. I always like to take a few moments. And um, when I get to do communion, it's a, definitely a blessing and a privilege. Um, for those of you who haven't served on Sundays, uh, it can be, there's all form of serving. Some are more obvious than others. Some are in the background. Some are uh, dealing with the, uh, the electronics and the online service. Some people are welcoming people, doing the coffee. Uh, it's a pretty large team, and uh, it's, again, a blessing to be a part of that. Um, and it's not about taking credit. It's just about being part of the service and, and being able to serve the Lord. But anyways, when I do communion, um, I like to take some time and try to not make it unique, but I, I try to, to pray and take some time and, and allow God to speak through me and, and to try to come out with a little bit of a, I guess, a, a message, but also keeping in mind it's, it's all about reflecting and remembering who God is and what he has done for us. Uh, so all that said, uh, yesterday I was reading uh, John chapter 1 with my family, and um, it was just a good reminder about how, yes, God died for us, yes, he rose again to pay for the penalties of our sin and so that we can rise again with him and be with him in eternity. But that's not the why. The why is he loves us and he wants a relationship with us. And in John chapter 1, he talks about how no one can see God. We know he's, we know he's, he's existing, we know he's all present, but we cannot see him, we just know he's there. But what he did for us is he sent his son Jesus in human form so that we can be physically seeing his character, physically seeing what he's all about, seeing his love in action, seeing him... Like, we haven't been able to see him personally, but in, through God's word and through his witnesses, we've been able to see his love for the needy, love for those that are being neglected, the widows, uh, people with leprosy, the people that are shunned from, from culture, and ultimately doing all this leading up to his ministry, and yes, ultimately dying on a cross for us and 
resurrecting and proving that he's king of kings and lord of lords. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of being a hypocrite, but I like to always share my struggles with you because I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, some of you, as Kevin mentioned last week, may be going off on holidays. Some of you may have camping every weekend that, that keeps you away from being here physically. Um, I personally don't have those, but I do the opposite. I, I just keep myself busy all summer long, all year long, I should say. Um, and resting and going camping is not the kind of rest that the Lord talks about. The rest that he provides for us is the kind of rest that he did on the seventh day. It's not the rest because he was tired. It's not rest because um, he wanted to take a break or take a vacation. His rest is reflection on what, the, on what he had done, reflection on his character and who he is, reflection on why he did it, I'm sure. And I'm sure there are other reasons why, but ultimately, make sure that this summer and throughout your weeks, that when you are seeking rest, you're seeking rest in him and not the things that you do and, and that you're taking rest from the world, but not the Lord. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite uh, the people that are helping me serve communion today. There's going to be a station here at the front, a station in the corner here, a station at the back, and another one near the Welcome Center. Uh, we apologize, we do not have gluten-free bread today, um, but you're still welcome to partake in the communion. And for those of you who don't understand, communion is for those who believe and accepted the Lord Jesus. It's a time, again, of, of repenting, reflecting, and just being uh, close to the Lord. And so we can come up. Uh, so first of all, we'll, <laughs> we'll get the elements going here. Just give me a few moments. And then once they arrive at the station, just go to your nearest one.
So we'll go through uh, taking of the elements, and then after that, I'll pray. So the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us to the point of bringing your son Jesus here on earth. He was human, but he was also fully God, Lord. And Lord, we thank you that you took the time through Jesus to go through life like we go through life, Lord, to suffer the things we suffer. Lord, uh, to show us ultimately the example of what it means to be like you. Lord, through your witnesses, throughout the history of the Bible, and the fact that we have it in in word, and the word is true, Lord. We are able to witness and see the example in your character of what it means to be like you. And Lord, we pray that throughout the summer that we do not lose sight of that, that we, not, we do not keep ourselves busy, Lord, and that through prayer and action, Lord, that we, we take the time to reflect on you, to take the time to Make sure that we are in the word, in prayer, being close to you, Lord, and that you are our number one priority. I pray this for myself, for my family, and for my church family, Lord. I pray that we do not neglect meeting together, and that doing these things as you command us to do, that we will be closer to you, closer to your family, we will be at rest, free of anxiety and stress, we will be overfilled with joy, Lord. And we'll be all, we will feel and enact the way that you made us to be, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that as Jesus came to earth, he also went through a lot of pain and suffering. People rejected him, Lord. People denied him being God. Even his own people laughed and mocked him, Lord. As he lay there on the on the cross, the the most gruesome and, and horrible way to die, Lord, and he was just willingly sacrificing his body and separating himself from you, just so that we can have that same opportunity and be with you in all eternity, Lord. I pray that as we reflect on that, that we stop what we're doing, stop stop our wants and our, and our complaining, Lord, and just be in awe of you and just devote our entire lives, our skills, our gifts, Lord, just, just to be with you and to be more like you. I, I pray that for each and one, every one of us here today. I pray these things in your name. Amen. What a wonderful prayer. Thanks, Corey. Um, for the kiddos, you can head downstairs now. Off you go. <laughs> And there goes the army. It's always a blessing to see. So uh, just in line with what Corey has uh, brought us through with communion and the uh, incredible blessings that we have in Christ Jesus because of his shed blood and because of his broken body, um, this song, I just want you guys to take the time to just use this song to be thankful to the Lord. Use this song to praise him and come together and worship and to honor our God who has sacrificed so much for us that we may be um, just filled with his glory to experience his grace. It's an incredible gift, so let's celebrate together this morning. This is also a new song. Thank you, my wife. Um, It's called God Really Loves Us. It's by David Crowder. So sing along as you can, and uh, just, you know, pray, kneel, do whatever you need to do to come before the Lord this morning and worship.
Good morning, church family. If I haven't yet met you, my name is John Mann, and I'm the Youth and Connections pastor here. And I want to read with you to this morning's scripture reading. So if you have your device or your Bible with you, turn it to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, and I'll be reading from verses 10 to 20. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible this morning. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Pray also for me, that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. Well, good morning, everybody. Am I on? All right, cool. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Aaron Bouchard, and uh, like I sa I've said before, I'm a dude here, and uh, I, uh, every once in a while, am invited here to preach, and it is my great honor to be able to use this gift that God has given to me uh, for his kingdom, for his glory, and so thank you for having me here this morning. Um, happy July, happy Canada Day, as we didn't get to celebrate this as a church. Uh, but it was yesterday. Happy Canada Day, everybody. Um, as this nation is uh, kind of getting darker and darker, we as a church can still celebrate who we are in Christ as Canadians, and more importantly, as fellow citizens of his kingdom, of his, his kingdom here on earth. And so as we uh, usher that in, as we witness to people, as we try to invite others into his kingdom, that is something to be very patriotic about. And so, happy Canada Day, and um, may God bless us as we continue to be his church and shining his light in his country. Uh, so thank you, John, for reading that passage in Ephesians 6. So I want you guys to turn with me to Ephesians 6, chapter 11. Or chapter, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 6, chapter 11. So verse 11. And we're going to read that again. As we uh, entered into this series, as Kevin kicked us off, um, we each as speakers have been given one verse with which to entertain you. So thankfully it's not about what I say, it's about what the Holy Spirit's going to say to each and every heart this morning, and I'm just here to, uh, to share what his words are and to preach. And so let's, put, let's pull up this passage, Ephesians 6. Verse 11 it says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So what does that mean? What are we talking about here? Um, another passage, another version of the Bible, sorry, not another passage, used the devil's wiles. You could stand against the wiliness of the devil. Um, what does it mean for me to stand? What does it mean for me to put on the full armor of God? Now, I've been strictly been told by Kevin that I am not allowed to use any other part of this, this main passage that we're speaking on because I can't take the thunder from another speaker who's going to be speaking on one of those other verses. So I can't go into the specific pieces of the armor this morning, but I can tell you what it means to equip yourself with the full armor, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on this morning, so that you can take your stand against the enemy's schemes. The devil is a schemer, and he's scheming against who? 
Well, I would say first and foremost, believers. And he has many others deceived who do not know God. He's scheming against humanity. He's scheming against God, ultimately. So he is your enemy. And the Bible talks about armor. Why do you think the Bible talks about armor? It's God's armor, not armor that God needs. It's not like uh, King Saul when he took off his armor to give to David. No, God specifically designed this armor for you and me. Why does the Bible talk about this armor? We're going to dive into that this morning. So let's go to the next slide, please, Michelle. If there's anything I want you guys to remember today, it's this first sentence. I want you to equip yourself and be fully prepared for the enemy. I want every person in this room, believer, and yes, those of you who are struggling to believe or may not believe at all, I want you to be fully equipped to fight against the enemy. You have an enemy. And as we've talked about before, This enemy isn't flesh and blood. You have an enemy. Okay? And I want you to be fully prepared for that enemy. I want to be fully prepared for that enemy. How many people here today, by uh, uh, a show of hands, feel like they are 100% prepared to battle the enemy this morning? Raise your hand. Maybe not, eh? We kind of have doubts. We're, we're a little bit like, oh, am, uh, have I fully equipped God's armor? What does that really mean? What does it mean to have all of it? What does it do? How does it serve me? And so we have these questions and we wonder, am I fully equipped? You can be. You can be fully equipped every day. And so we're going to talk about what that means. Equip yourself and be fully prepared for the enemy. There is a literal spiritual war raging right now. And I find many of us, especially in countries where there's a lot of peace and a time of peace, and we're starting to see the tail end of that peace, I believe, in Canada as believers. We're starting to see a lot more resistance to our way of life. I don't know if you guys have noticed. I have. (laughs) Um, And so because of this resistance, we're starting to see that the realities of this spiritual war Uh, war more and more, almost monthly. Some people would say almost daily. More and more realities of spiritual war going on for the country of Canada. But this war has been going on since the beginning, since Adam and Eve, since Satan fell, when he was Lucifer and he fell, and he took a third of the angels in heaven with him. These became demons. These demons want to take you down. They're real, and there is a literal spiritual war waging, and this war has physical consequences in this world. This war doesn't just happen, it's like, oh, it's a spiritual war, so it's not in my realm, I'm fine. The problem is, this spiritual war has physical consequences, and I think those of us who have had suffering in our lives, have had family members fall into addiction, have had sin in our own hearts that we can't overcome, have had temptations thrown our way after we've had years of victory, we know that this war is real and it has physical consequences. And yet I find many in our country who are believers do not live and and think as if this war is real. We live as if it's a side note that we can just think about once in a while. And then we go off on our merry way and do our regular stuff that we like to do. And so I want to caution us against that this morning. This battle is a battle that needs to be taken seriously. It is a spiritual war. It is the greatest war. The greatest war. You think World War II was bad. Imagine being sent off. Young men and young women back then, imagine... You're at home with the kids by yourself for five years. And the likelihood is that your spouse will die. And maybe if you're lucky enough that your husband gets conscripted in the last year, or maybe he was one of the ones that maybe survived. Some of you may have grandparents who were in the war of World War II, and they know what the suffering is like. I can't imagine. I've lived in peacetime. I can't imagine what it's like. But imagine the horror of that war. Some of you have been in the military. You know what it's like to see the guns go off. You know what it's like to hear the explosions. 
Most of us in this room, if that happened next to our building, we would all hunker down in panic. And they face that every day. Imagine the greatness of that war, the slaughter, the death. This is nothing, nothing in comparison to the war that's waged spiritually for the souls of men and women and children. Nothing. And we see it in how our culture responds to the basics of morality these days. They have rejected God's morality. They have rejected the family. They have rejected husband, wife, and children. They have rejected the truths of, of, of how you're born. And because of these things, our world is doing this down the toilet. And it's not because of people, necessarily. It's because of our true enemy. And that enemy is Satan. He wants to twist the minds and hearts of men and women. This is a war. And you guys are like, man, he's getting heavy on this this morning. But I want to impose on you, impress on you, the importance of understanding what this is. Where you are. You are not yet in the kingdom of God in heaven. You are God's ambassadors here on earth right now, if you're a believer. We are at war. The question is, am I prepared to stand against a powerful enemy? Kevin uh, talked about it a bit last week, about how the enemy, Satan, he's not weak. He's not powerless. Christ, through the victory he's had on the cross and the resurrection from the dead, has broken Satan's power for those who believe, but he still has power. And Christians who are not equipping the full armor of God can fall victim to the power of Satan. Not with regards to your salvation, you are saved, but with regards to your effectiveness for the gospel of Christ. And not only that, with regards to the level of suffering you experience in your life on this earth. He's real, he is powerful. And he wants to take you down. (laughs) He wants to take you down. It was interesting as I I think back to when John was speaking about Revelation chapter 9. Way back. If you guys remember Pastor John speaking about that. He talked about the Nephilim and how there's this theory that they are, they are the, or when these locusts, sorry, come up. There's this theory from Kaiser, from his book, that they are in fact the Nephilim. These demonic creatures that are released to harm those who don't believe in God. And the power that these beings have. For those of us who are unprepared as believers, these beings can take us down and put us flat on our face. So, that's the bad news. I hope you're not shaking in your boots too much. Here's the good news. We talk about the full armor. So let's go to the next slide, please. We have a powerful enemy. So how are we going to stand Well, here's the simple answer. Don't leave a single part unguarded. (laughs) It's very simple. It's very simple, but it's very difficult in practice for those of us who are trying to improve, who are trying to improve in our relationship with God. Do not leave a single part unguarded. We cannot be properly equipped for battle against the enemy if we aren't fully outfitted. So, put on, and I put emphasis there, the full armor of God. The full armor of God. Christian here today, I'm asking you, have you put on today, this morning, the full armor of God? This is one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. I got a lot of them, so I'll say that like a hundred times while I'm preaching, but this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I love this passage. I've memorized the uh, I don't know about the the certain translation. I've probably gotten a few mixed together over the years. But I've memorized the essence and all the armor. And I encourage you to do so because when you wake up in the morning and you're tired and you had a rough day at work yesterday and you're feeling weak, when you pray on the armor and you equip it, what a difference it makes in your day. I can tell you from experience. It makes a huge difference. A huge difference in your ability to stand against the enemy. What is the armor for? The armor is not for anything but dealing with the enemy. That's how it's described here. 
so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. This armor is given to you by God to stand against an enemy that's more powerful than you without it. That's what this armor's for. It is your defensive equipment against Satan. So put on the full armor. In the original uh, language here, it, it translates to pano panoplian. I hope I said that. I probably butchered that. But anyway, it means a complete set. If you think about the uh, ancient uh, Roman armor set, this is what Paul was actually referring to, is this ancient Roman set of armor. And uh, they had all the, all the pieces. They had the belt. They had the breastplate. They had the helmet. They had the boots. They had the sword. Of the, the, the sword they had the shield. And it was kind of like a little skirt thing and uh, maybe a cape. But anyway, this, this belt held together the entire assembly of this armor. I love how that's called the belt of truth. But anyway, I'm not going to get into other people's passages. But the whole point is the armor of God. Sorry, Tony, or whoever's coming up next. The armor of God is a complete set. So what is a complete set? What does that mean if this complete set is not fully equipped? It's what? Incomplete. Right? If there's a chink in the armor, the soldier won't stand for long. If any of you guys have ever uh, researched, like, ancient warfare where people had on armor and they used swords and shields and bows and all that stuff, people are always looking for the chink in the armor, the weak spot, the part in the armor that they could get an arrow through or they could drive a sword thrust through um, or they could rip a piece off or whatever. They're always looking for that chink. Usually it was around the shoulders where your arms move or, you know, the back where the breastplate wasn't as, uh, wasn't as thick or whatever. They would find a place. And even today in modern warfare, people wear protective equipment, bulletproof vests and helmets and stuff like that, but there are sections where people are like, hey, we'll aim there. And so the enemy is always looking for your chink in your armor. So, if there's a chink in the armor, the, the soldier won't stand for long. So what's this? This armor is designed for each saint. I talked about that a little bit already. God's ability, my response. So let's look back at this passage. It says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. The full armor of who? Of God. So whose armor is it? God's. <laughs> Why is that important? How many times as believers have we tried to overcome the enemy through our own strength, through our own power, through our own ability, and we fall flat on our face? And Kevin talked about this last week as well. God's armor is his armor. It's a supernatural equipping. Do you guys understand the significance of that? It is a spiritual equipping. It surrounds you even now as the enemy tries to attack you. It is a spiritual equipping. God's ability, my response. So God has the ability to give you his armor. But you have to respond in kind and equip it. And I want to point out another thing. Unbelievers, I'm sorry if you're an unbeliever here today. I have some bad news. You are unable to equip God's armor. If you do not know the Lord God as, the Lord Jesus as your Savior, if you have not trusted in the blood of Christ that cleanses you from all of your sin, and if you do not believe that he was resurrected after three days in the grave and you haven't surrendered your life to him, you cannot equip God's armor. And the reason why is because as unbelievers, they have a darkened understanding of God himself. So to support that, I want you guys to turn with me to Ephesians 4. Same book, verses 17 and 18. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Gentiles, just a word to describe those who aren't Jews. In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. 
Unbelievers are ignorant of God. Ignorant. What does that mean? It means they simply don't know him. They don't know about him, and they don't know what he's offering. A believer might come into the relationship and say, hey, I've got some great news for you. Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the whole world, as John 3.16 says. If you don't know God today, you can know him. You can have a relationship with him. He wants to have a relationship with you. He loves you, and he wants to know you personally and deeper than anybody else in your life has ever known you. He already does. He wants you to know him deeply and personally, more so than anyone else you know. And he wants to equip you to get through this difficult life, praising him through the difficulty, filled with joy, filled with purpose, Filled with a sense of a home that's coming in the new heaven and new earth. Praise God, right? Praise God for the truth of his word. This is what God wants for you, unbeliever. He wants this for you. If you would simply place your trust in him, in Jesus Christ, what he paid on the the cross for your sins, you can have eternal life. And you you can be set up with the complete set of God's armor. But until the Holy Spirit softens that heart that's been hardened. Once you've heard the message, you might feel that sting from the Holy Spirit. Say, ooh, I'm not in a good place with God. How do I respond to that? Until you respond by saying, yes, I am a sinner. I do repent. I come before you, Jesus, knowing that I can't do anything to earn salvation, but I accept your free gift of grace. Until you do that, you cannot equip God's armor. I implore you (laughs) to make the decision to trust Jesus today. Another thing, you believers, you're not off the hook. Sorry. (laughs) I'm not off the hook. Many believers are ill-equipped for battle. Guys, I want to stress the importance of this. The equipment, equipping of the full armor of God, I cannot stress it enough. We are entering into a time where we now must draw a line in the sand as believers. No longer can we dabble in the world and dabble in Christ. That time is over. God is calling his children out of that in Canada. The Church of Laodicea, it's time to wake up. No more lukewarm Christian. Because the enemy will take you down. And God is kind of shaking things up right now, and he's bringing us to a place in our country where we no longer have the choice as believers to kind of quietly hang out in the background and just enjoy the comforts of this life and believe in God at the same time. That day, I think, is coming to an end. So by natural process of how things are going, we will, we will be forced to make a decision as believers either to stand against the enemy, not against people, not hating people, against the enemy, the devil. And he will use people, don't get me wrong, he will use people to hurt you, to insult you, to hate you, because they're darkened in their understanding as unbelievers, and Satan will use them to attack you, whether verbally or physically, it will happen. But they are not our enemy. Our enemy is the devil. So we love them. We pray for them. And we fight against our true enemy. Are you ready? Are you ill-equipped? There's a reason why some people are ill-equipped. If we look at Romans 13.12, please turn with me there right now. Romans 13.12. I have a little sticky notes here so I can quickly get to my Bible passage so I can beat all of you guys. Here we go. Somebody probably beat me. But anyway, Romans 13, 12 says this. Oh, praise God for the first line here. The night is nearly over. Amen. Right? The night is, come on, church. The night is nearly over. Praise God. Come on. Wake up. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. 
So let us put aside the deeds of darkness. Oh, look, even believers can be tempted by darkness. Surprise, surprise. Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on what? The armor of light. Who is the armor of light? Jesus Christ. Put on Christ. Put on Christ. Christian, if, 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 if you're missing a piece of the armor, and I encourage you to read down that passage that I'm not allowed to read down, and look at those other pieces of armor, okay? And think, ask yourself, am I missing this piece? Am I missing this piece? Am I doing this thing? Am I surrendering this thing? Am I holding on to this sin? Am I holding on to this doubt? Am I letting this person make me feel like a piece of garbage? Am I choosing to hate them? Am I holding on to unforgiveness? A lack of forgiveness? Am I chained to the debt I think somebody else owes me? If you're a believer, you are a believer. You've accepted Christ. But these things can still happen to you. Are you equipped for battle? Choose light over darkness. Those who are ill-equipped are choosing darkness over light. They are Christians, but they are choosing the darkness of sin and its pleasures over the light of the armor of God, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Romans 13, 14. Rather, clothe yourselves. That's literally the next verse. Or two verses down? Two verses down. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify what? The desires of the flesh. We've talked about this before. I've spoken to you guys about this. What is the flesh? Is it your physical body? No. The flesh is the sin nature that exists in your physical body. That is the flesh. It affects your flesh. Okay? But the flesh is your sin nature. So, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Satan keeps bringing, one of his main tactics, he keeps bringing fleshly stuff to you. Do this. Do that. Doesn't, doesn't that person look nice? I know they're not your spouse, but it doesn't hurt just to think. You know, like, oh, you know, uh, don't talk to that individual. I know God's telling you to go and pray with them, but that's awkward. Don't do that. Right? This is the enemy's tactics. And so if we clothe ourselves with Christ, and we do it daily, and we do it every second of every day, I've kind of learned as I've gone through this big process over this past year of God sanctifying me like crazy, and I know many in this church have experienced that as well, I feel like God kind of did it all at once. And we've had this huge sanctifying stuff and the people are started coming and we've had huge blessings. People who haven't been to church in a while are coming back and people are being transformed and being baptized and we're seeing this incredible growth through this time of incredible adversity in our culture. Praise God for that. But the whole point is that as we are, as we are growing, are we putting on the Lord Jesus Christ every single day? I know that in my personal life, through this past year of sanctification, the Lord has kind of taught me what that actually means. I can sense almost when I'm like, I'm just going just gonna to enjoy this, God, for a little bit today, and I'll go on my phone, and I'm just kind of watching a movie. Or, and it seems innocent, but I lose my connection with Jesus for a period of time. And I'm not really in fellowship with him. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's all the temptations. Just slap me in the face. And I'm like, why? Why is this coming back? Why is it coming back, God? And God's like, well, let's, uh, how about you just come and hang out with me? <laughs> he does. He's like, because you know. He's like, how about you just come and hang out with me? So then I go and I hang out with him and it's gone. Oh, what do you know? It's gone. And God is kind of, this process, because it keeps happening over and over again, God, God has kind of shown me the difference between living in the world and for its pleasures and just living in constant fellowship with him. There's a, there's a difference, and it seems subtle until you start to see it. And you're like, oh, okay, I see God. And God's like, you know, when you go home, Aaron, just put your phone down, man. He doesn't talk to me like that. That's me paraphrasing. But <laughs> just put your phone down. 
Be with your family. Is the phone a bad thing? No, it's a tool. But if it's, if it's being used as an idol, if it's being used as something that takes me away from God, if it's being used as something to distract me from life's troubles instead of going to God's word and seeking him through life's troubles, if I'm using it as something to enjoy things that I shouldn't be enjoying, then it is a problem. And it does need to go. And that's the difference between being in the world, but not of the world, and then being in the world. So clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Think about Jesus. Think about being with him. Think about being in fellowship with God. And you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. So don't leave a single part unguarded. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to talk a little bit about, that's what you should do, that's how you can stand. Now we're going to talk about what the devil's schemes are. So stand against the devil's schemes. The wiles of the devil. I think of the wily coyote. He's always after the roadrunner, but he never gets him. Right? Roadrunner always outsmarts him. And that is a Christian equipped with the armor of God. We're the roadrunner, and the devil's the wily coyote who can't catch us. But the second we let our guard down, he's ready for lunch. Okay? That's slightly showing you what this battle is. He has, he's very strategic. I'm going to talk about him a little bit. He doesn't deserve much conversation, but we need to be equipped. So he's a very skillful leader. His purpose is to divide, depress, make ineffective. This is for a believer. This passage is written to believers. His purpose in your life is to divide you from who? God. And who else? Fellowship with one another. Corey touched on that this morning. Even if you're off at the camp, how are you fellowshipping with believers while you're there? What are you doing to spend time with fellow Christians? When you go and you head out to the camp, nothing wrong with going to the camp. When you go to head, there's something wrong with not fellowshipping with God. Right? So when you go out to the camp, Is your Bible there with you? Or is it a uh, cooler full of beer? When we go out to the camp, are we spending time together in fellowship with people who we know are believers there? Maybe our family member, maybe a friend that's come with us. And I'm challenging myself because, I'm going to be honest with you, there's a big group of us going to Ivanhoe tomorrow. We're going to play some spike ball. We're going to... uh, just hang out with our kids, and we are fellow believers, and we're going to fellowship in the Lord. Because that's what, that's what Christians do. That's how we stay equipped. That's how we stay equipped with the armor of light. He's a skillful leader. He wants to divide you. He wants to depress you. He wants you to get to the place where you feel like God hates you. That's where he got me to. He got me to a place where I felt like God was done with me, and I was under his judgment. And still, every once in a while, he throws that in my face. But now, I've had so much truth thrown in my face from God in love that I can just look at that and be like, that old argument again? Really, bud? And I'm going to just brush that aside. You know how I do it? I just repeat passages. The Lord does not wish that any should perish. The work he began in you, he will work into completion. For God so loved the world. God seeks somebody with a contrite heart. Stuff like that. So get out of here, Satan. He wants to depress you. And as a believer, he wants to make you ineffective for the gospel. Let's go to Ephesians 4.14. And it says... I'll start with 13. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. There are many would-be biblical preachers out there today who are preaching a false gospel. There are many people out there who want to deceive you with ideologies. These are tactics of the enemy. He uses people 
to try to confuse you, to try to make you ineffective. If he gets you confused and, and your belief process messed up with God, then he can take you into these things like depression and ineffectiveness because he's already attacked your core belief system. And so that's why I showed you guys that passage. Becoming mature in Christ is a big part of putting on the armor of God. So he's waiting for an opening. This is a sin that gives a foothold. Please turn with me to 1 Peter 5, 8 to 11. A lot of so supporting passages this morning because I got one verse to work with. So 1 Peter 5, 8 to 11. I got to stop complaining about that. It's actually really good. But anyway. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, and Kevin touched on this last week, prowls around like a li roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. So what's the enemy always doing? Looking. Looking at your life. Looking for an opening. He's restless. Relentless with this. Okay? Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. What is faith? Simply trusting in Christ. Because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Interesting how he talks about the physical sufferings of the brothers as a part of the prowling around of the enemy trying to attack Christians. He'll use physical suffering. And the God of all grace, verse 10, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, talking about this life, not a period of your life, this whole life is the little while. After you, after you have suffered a little while, there is suffering in this life. There will be suffering in this life. I'm not going to lie to you and say that Jesus is just going to make all your suffering go away. He doesn't promise us that. He promises us eternal glory in Christ after we have suffered for a little while, and he promises us blessings and joy to get through this life while we suffer. He will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. The enemy is looking for a foothold, foot, foothold in your life to take you down. That's usually a sin. It could also be somebody else sinning in close proximity to you and how you respond to it. Okay? There's many ways in which the enemy can find a foothold. But if we are equipped with God's armor, he will never find one. He will never find one. And then the last thing I want to talk about with the enemy is that he is the father of lies. He wants you deceived. If you go to John 8, verse 44... And I want to point out to you that who Jesus is talking to here. Believers, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here. He's talking to the religious leaders of the day here in Israel. 44, you belong to your father, the devil. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. Never trust a word that comes out of Satan's mouth. There is no truth in him. Zip. Zero. Okay? When he lies, he speaks his native language. Those of you who English is not your first language here today, imagine lying being your native language. I can't even fathom that, but that's Satan. He literally walks around lying nonstop. He will even use half-truths to spin a lie. He did that to Jesus. For he is a liar and, his incredible title, the father of lies. The father of lies. Guys, it's so important that we understand who we're standing against because when we understand our enemy, we understand his tactics and we can actually pinpoint what's happening during our times of temptation. We can pinpoint it. When he, when he says a lie to you in your head and you hear this lie and you're like, that doesn't really sound right. That's the devil. 
he, he's, he's whispering a lie, and he's trying to tempt you into sin. And when we have the armor of God equipped, we can, we can point out these lies fairly easily. So, this is all pretty crazy. We're talking about this armor. We're talking about the devil's schemes. We're talking about being fully equipped. The enemy is powerful, but God is greater. Amen? God is greater. And he will equip you. He promises to equip you for the battle. So let's finally turn to 2 Peter 1, 3-8. And I want to read this to you guys in closing. Let this be your prayer. Let this be your mission this week, this passage, okay? His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Through our knowledge of him, Jesus, who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. You may participate in the divine nature. That's incredible. And escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to per perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kind kindness, and sisterly kindness. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, from one degree of glory to another, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you get this list, focus on this list this week, pray over this list this week, act on those prayers this week. And as you increase in this during your relationship with God, as he draws you into more and more of these characteristics, you will be kept from being unproductive in your faith. For a believer, that is the enemy's ultimate goal for you is to make you ineffective for the gospel of Christ. He can't touch your salvation, but what he can do is make it so that you aren't very effective at bringing others to salvation. Or you're ineffective in fellowshipping with God. He wants, to, he wants to create a barrier between your ability to fellowship and worship God. Number one. He wants you to be a depressed person all the way into the kingdom of God. So focus on this list, pray over this list, and God will equip you with his full armor. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the truths of your word. I thank you, Lord, that I can literally just, through your Holy Spirit, be thrown to this verse and that verse and all these supporting passages. We call them supporting passages, but really it's just your word. Your word is truth. And your word cuts deeper than a double-edged sword, right to the bone. And God, as you cut, as you cut our hearts to the bone, I pray that you would fill us with your truth. I pray that you would fill us with the knowledge and belief in the truth. And God, that that would change our actions, that we would equip your full armor this morning and every day moving forward. In Jesus' name, amen. We got one more song for you guys. So please stand with us as we sing.
Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for the truth that you are a good and gracious king. And Lord, as we've been challenged this morning, as we've been um, you know, brought to the truth of your word about your armor and about how we can equip it and about our enemy, God, I pray that we would be encouraged by the fact that you are a good and gracious king, that you have mercy and forgiveness and healing for those who are hurting. And I thank you, God, for the truth of the word of God, your word, in Jesus' name. 